Hello everyone, welcome to Teachly University. And in my lecture today, we're gonna to be discussing Psycho-Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz. And this is a, I don't wanna say a summary, but we're gonna be touching on some of the more important parts of the book. And I get like, I've said in my other videos going over like Things Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill and The Science of Getting Rich by, Rich by Wallace D. Waddles. There's so much to unpack in these books. It's going to take a number of lectures to really discuss many of its really important topics. But we're really going to be discussing what I think are some of the more important topics of psycho cybernetics. It can really help guide us into understanding what Maltz was talking about in the book and really how it can help us, as in the subtitle says, to really to get more out of life. And Maxwell Maltz, for those of you who don't know who he is, uh, he was, uh, or Dr. Maxwell Maltz for that matter, uh, he was a plastic surgeon in the 50s and 60s. And what he noticed was, and what inspired him to write the book, was that he noticed that in doing many of his plastic surgeries to help heal physical deformities in many of his patients, what he noticed was that after the surgery, there was a profound personality change in many of his patients, where prior to the surgery, Many of his patients were suffering from depression, uh, poor self-image, self-limiting beliefs that impacted their career and their relationships that really just prevented them from getting the most out of life. But what he noticed was that after the surgery, when he was able to heal many of their physical deformities, there was this very profound personality change where these people just mat really were just able to improve their overall mental health. They became happier, much more well-adjusted. They, they, they began to thrive in their careers again to make more money. They improved their relationships and they were essentially able to heal themselves after this surgery or the surgeries that Maxwell Maltz did and many of his patients. So that's really what led him to write Psycho-Cybernetics was that what he found was that what is holding so many people back was the poor self-image that they held of themselves that prevented them from getting the most out of life. Now, it's important to keep in mind that not all of the patients that he conducted surgery on had this personality change. Many of them really didn't change at all, or in fact, they got worse. But the common theme that he found was that it's really about self-image and how the self-image we hold of ourselves can really be the key to determining whether or not we get the most out of life. So to quote Maxwell Maltz, he says that you will act like the sort of person you conceive yourself to be. So your self-limiting beliefs or your beliefs about yourself or your paradigm, your self-image can determine the kind of results that you get in your life. And it's like Earl Nightingale says in, in The Strangest Secret, you become what you think about, what you focus on, what you zero in on, and what you believe can determine the kind of life you're going to have. Or, or as Joseph Dispenza says, your personality shapes your own personal reality. And our personality is formed by the repetitive thoughts and actions that we engage in over time since we were young that helped shape our personality and thus our personal reality. So one of the big underlying themes that Maxwell Maltz discusses in his book is that we are, our brains or human beings are goal striving creatures. So we're designed that once we focus on a particular goal, we become fixated on it, we focus on it, we get specific and detailed about what it is that we want we will naturally strive towards that goal. And that's really where we're at our best. And also Mahaley Simmons and Hiley discusses this in his book, Flow, is that when we're actually working on a particular project, and that we're at our best, not when we're resting, but we're working on something that isn't too difficult, but isn't too easy, but it's just enough to challenge us where we begin to lose our sense of self and we become something more. We become less over, less analytical and we begin to use our higher mental faculties to achieve and become something more. We become a better person as a result of pursuing these goals where the goal itself is not as important as a person we become. So again, to quote Maltz, in fact, it is literally impossible to really think positively about a particular situation as long as you hold a negative concept of yourself. Again, the self-image. Numerous experiments have shown that once a concept of the self is changed, other things consistent with the new self are accomplished easily and without strain. So I'm going to say that again. The concept of the self is changed. Other things consistent with the new self are accomplished easily and without strain. This reminds me of Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, where he said, and I'm going to paraphrase, to think that earning wealth requires hard work, perish the thought. 
So it's not about strain or working hard or trying to force things to happen. When you become the person that you want to be, the kind of person that would accumulate wealth and great relationships and happiness and joy, the results take care of themselves. So the work then is focusing on the inner dialogue, the inner work, the inner mental habits that we have that can produce profound results and then can help us get most out of life. But as long as we hold a negative self-image or hold these, this, this really harmful paradigm, these, this belief system that's holding us back, it's going to be very difficult to get the most out of life and really get the desired results that we want and become happier and more well-rounded people. So to quote Bob Proctor, who was in The Secret and who is one of the most profound and most successful personal growth coaches uh, in the industry, and unfortunately, uh, he passed away not too long ago as of the making of this lecture. He said that a paradigm is a multitude of habits fixed in our subconscious mind that we act on without any conscious thought. And it's our actions that produce our results. So we have these fixed subconscious beliefs. And when you think about that, the vast majority of our thoughts and actions are 95% of them are totally unconscious. We don't even realize that we're telling this, we're living out this story that we created for ourselves or this self-imposed prison that is difficult to get out of because we're totally unconscious. We're totally unaware that these beliefs that we hold of ourselves are holding us back. And many of these self-limiting beliefs were formed since we were children. That over time, through repetition, we've become hypnotized into believing and thinking and acting in a certain way that goes against our self-interest. So then it is no exaggeration to say that every human being is hypnotized to some extent either by ideas he has uncritically accepted from others or ideas he has repeated to himself or convinced himself are true. These negative ideas have exactly the same effect upon our behavior as the negative ideas implanted into the mind of a hypnotized subject by a professional hypnotist. So to, to kind of break this down a little bit, as I mentioned before, that many of our self-limiting beliefs were formed since we were children. And many of us, I would argue, have experienced some sort of trauma, whether it was abuse, financial hardship, uh, perhaps we were ridiculed as children. Uh, maybe we experienced, you know, for some extreme situations, many of us were in war or other traumatic experiences that really cemented some of these self-limiting beliefs that we've carried over into adulthood. And the problem is how many of our habits and, and thoughts and actions are, are formed is through repetition that over time shape our personality. When you repeat the same thoughts and actions over time, and again, we can think neuroplasticity through that or Hebb's law, whatever fires together, wires together, we cement these neural networks in our brain that over time shape these thought processes where we have the same predictable behavior based on specific circumstances in our environment. We react a certain way when we're in traffic, for example or react a certain way when we try to develop relationships with other people. But we have the same sort of mindset or thought process when it comes to money and how to earn more of it. And unfortunately, many of these beliefs that we hold were really uh, injected into our mind, not by us, but really by the ideas that we're subjected to on a consistent basis. Let, let's face it, we are bombarded with a constant stream of negative information on a daily basis from social media, the 24 hours new, new cycle. We live in a culture that really is an incubator for self-limiting beliefs. And that's no wonder why so many people are struggling with depression and anxiety, because many of us have been hypnotized to believe that we're not good enough. So the important thing for you to remember is that it does not matter in the least how you got the idea or where it came from. You may never have met a professional hypnotist. You may never have been formally hypnotized, but if you have accepted an idea from yourself, your teachers, your parents, friends, and advertisements from any other source, and further, if you are firmly convinced the idea is true, it is the same power over you as the hypnotist's words have over hypnotized subjects. So you can think positively as much as you want, but as long as you subconsciously have this paradigm of self-limiting beliefs where you believe you're not good enough, where you've accepted these ideas that have been given to us by teachers, parents, by social media, by the advertisements and marketing we're subjected to on a daily basis, the negativity that we see all the time, 
If we accept these ideas as true over time, that will become ingrained as part of our beliefs. And these self-limiting beliefs thus will prevent us from living the best life possible. And ultimately, we, get, we just cannot get the most out of life because we've been hypnotized to think a certain way that goes against our self-interest. And the good news, though, however, is that though many of us are hypnotized, we can get out of it by becoming much more self-aware of the fact that perhaps we've been hypnotized and believing negative beliefs and negative ideas about ourselves and that we can actually change. So I have found that one of the, the commonest causes of unhappiness among my patients is that they are attempting to live their lives on the deferred payment plan. They do not live or enjoy life now, but wait for some future event or occurrence. They will be happy when they get married, when they get a better job, when they get the house paid for, when they get the children through college, when they have completed some task or won some victory, victory invariably, they are disappointed. So the best way to, to break this sort of hypnotic spell that all of us have, have struggled with is to first become aware of the fact that we need to stop waiting for something outside of us to make us feel better. We're constantly waiting to be happy, to be fulfilled, to be happy with ourselves, to enjoy life because we're waiting for something outside of us to happen, waiting for the money, the relationships, the house, all these material possessions, we're waiting for these things to come into our lives so that we can be happy. The problem is, and the irony is, and how often have we heard this story, how many celebrities do we, do we hear about who have it all, who have the money and the fame and all the, the, the goodies, right? But then at the end, they end up living miserable lives and some of them have gone to the extreme of, of taking their own life because they thought that if once they got the wealth and the relationships and all that good stuff, they were gonna be happy and they found out it didn't do anything. It actually made them feel worse. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to want to accumulate wealth or to try to get more notoriety in your life and achieve these goals. I'm not saying that. But when we keep waiting to be happy, we never enjoy life now. And what we experience for many of us is this gap between our current circumstances and our dreams and our goals and our desired life. So we feel this separation from abundance, from love, from happiness, from meaningful relationships, from the wealth, from the great career, whatever it is that you want, we feel this separation. And it's this gap where we experience frustration, anxiety, fear, anger, all these negative emotions that many of us are guilty of succumbing, succumbing to, myself included. I've often felt these, these emotions often in my life in pursuing entrepreneurship and building a better life. And it's this gap of, of who we are to who we really want to be, to the person we want to become. It's this gap, this separation that creates so much mental distress. And what Maltz is really suggesting here is that we stop waiting for that outside event to change us and really to take that leap of faith where we stop waiting for something outside to change us, but in fact, we begin acting as if our prayers have been answered. And this is something Neville Goddard talks a lot about in his work uh, in The Power of Awareness where we channel into these godlike powers that we have, or what Neville talks about, that we have this inner Christ inside of us, that we have these godlike powers when we begin to act on these ideas that as if our prayers have been answered. And when we do that, we begin to transform our life, we begin to, to shift and refocus on the things that we don't want to the things that we do want. And it's this reshifting of our focus where without much effort, our life begins to change. We, st we begin to see results happen that maybe, or opportunities, experience begin to occur that we didn't see before. And it's what Maltz talks about is reshifting our focus. Again, remember, we're goal-striving mechanisms. Well, we're goal-striving organisms for that matter. That when we reshift our focus to what we want, that's when we can see profound change and we add emotional intensity to that. We begin acting and feeling as if our prayers have been answered. That's when the good stuff happens. That's when we really can get the most out of life now, regardless of what our circumstances are. That's when we can see change. So your nervous system cannot tell the difference between an imagined experience and a real experience. In either case, it reacts automatically to information that you give, it, give to it from your forebrain. Your nervous system reacts appropriately to what you think or imagine to be true. So this, what he's suggesting here, and I've discussed this in my work, on the power of the subconscious mind, and I'll, and I'll add the link to this, to one of my older lectures, uh, to this video. 
is that our nervous system, our subconscious mind cannot tell the difference between what's real or not. What does that mean? So let's say, for example, you recall the memory that you had. You had an argument maybe with your boss uh, that you had a, maybe at a previous job. Even though that happened several years ago, when you recall that memory of that argument with your boss, you begin to feel maybe your, your heartbeat uh, increase. Maybe you start to sweat. You become to fidget. You get uncomfortable. Uh, you begin to feel physically as if that argument is occurring, even though that happened several years ago. Or another good example is that maybe you had a, one point, you were flying one day. You were on a flight for business, or maybe you were on vacation. You had a really bad experience in the flight. There was bad turbulence. Even though maybe that happened a year ago, when you recall that flight, you you could you feel the physical sensation as if you were in that flight now in present time. And our and it shows also that our memories could be very misleading and very shoddy. We can recall events that may never have happened. That's how powerful our brains are, and we can begin to imagine circumstances that maybe have never happened. But subconsciously, we believe them to be true because of the emotional intensity that we've attached to those memories and thoughts and ideas that we hold in our minds. And that especially holds true with our beliefs. So when we begin to change our beliefs and believe as if our prayers have been answered, that the wealth we've been looking for is here, the relationship we've been looking for is here, and begin to contemplate what that would feel like, our subconscious or our nervous system does not know the difference. And we begin to consciously live out our dreams in the present moment. This is a, I know this is a lot to take in. But there's the science behind this when it comes to the subconscious mind. And how it really uh, embodying what it is that we want now, rather than waiting for something out there to materialize so that we can be happy. That's when we really begin to reshift our focus to the things that we want. And when we change our focus and strive towards those goals, we begin to realize that it's not the goal itself that we really want, it's the person that we become. So creative striving for a goal that is important to you as a result of your own deep felt needs, aspirations, and talents, and not the symbols which the Joneses expect you to display, bring happiness as well as success because you will be functioning as you were meant to function. Man is by nature a goal striving being. And because man is built that way, he is not happy unless he is functioning as he was made to function, as a goal striver. Thus, true success and true happiness not only go together, but each enhances the other. So Mihaly Simonson highly discusses this in his work on, on flow. And I also uh, have a whole lecture on flow, which I'll, again, I also add the link to this video. So true happiness and success occurs not when we're resting or when we're on vacation, laying on the beach somewhere. Not to say there's anything wrong with that. But true happiness and success occurs when we are working on something that is worthwhile. When we enter these states of flow, when we're not, we're totally immersed in what it is that we're doing. An optimal experience lives in this state of flow. When we're so immersed in what we're doing, we truly lose our sense of self. We lose our sense of time. Mind and body are one. And really, everything is firing all cylinders. A lot of athletes describe being in this situation when they're in, a, in the zone, right? When they are totally immersed in what they're doing, they just, they're on their game. So when you're in these moments, when you're totally immersed in what it is that you're doing and you're thoroughly enjoying it, you become your best self. And that's where there's biological processes involved where um, melatonin and norepinephrine and all these feel-good chemicals and dopamine are all uh, being injected into the body as a result of when we're in these states of flow. And that's when we become much more receptive to new ideas and new experiences. Because we're not analytical anymore. We're not overly self-conscious, as, as Maxwell Maltz discusses, to be careful of, to be wary of. Not to be overly self-conscious and to begin to act out on our ideas. And when we do that, we become something more. And Maltz also says, and he's referring to an experiment and in a research in the book. His experiments prove that the best way to break a habit is to form a clear mental image of the desired end result and to practice without effort towards reaching that goal that either positive practice or negative practice performing the habit consciously and voluntarily would have beneficial effects provided the desired end result was kept constantly in mind. Again, when you become what you think about, when you hold a clear image of what you want, again, without forcing it, without this uh, trying to force things to predict things, without that much effort, when you begin just embodying what it is that you want, when you hold that image in your mind, 
on a consistent basis and bring emotion to that image, that's when things begin to, to change. And that's when we can really, you know, unleash these uh, or release the shackles that have been holding us back in this self-imposed prison. And we can live our best life and we can develop new beliefs that enhance our self-image and improve our, our self-image about ourselves. And we really, we can then see profound change in our life for the better. And we can get the desired results that we want without having to wait for something outside to change us. When we live in the end, as Neville Goddard says, and begin being happy now, no matter what our circumstances are, that's when we can see profound change. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and I'll see you in my next lecture. Take care.